<laughs> All right. Welcome to another episode of I'm Working On It. We have a very special guest this week. Uh, you know him from The Heat, his comedy album, Read the Room, Mad TV, a million other amazing things. Adam Ray. Thanks, bro. How yeah. about my most recent credit? Jesus Christ. Young Rock? Do your research. Young Rock? There it is, bro. Yeah. That's exciting stuff. Yeah, dude. That, yeah, how? Because here's why that's uh, special. Just because if we get more seasons, knock on wood, uh, I'm going to have to take steroids. <laughs> Are you really? Like, well, you're going to have to I work mean, out and shit? <laughs> or just work out, yeah. But I mean, I don't know. Steroids seems like a lot more fun. It's almost like the way, I don't know if you ever had a friend that was like, I want to go to jail just to see what it's like. Yeah. That's not me, but for steroids, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I already floated that to my mom and she was like, you can't do that. It'll, but what? Your muscles won't be able to take it or lack thereof, <laughs> you pussy ass bitch. Um, yeah. So, but the show did well over 5 million in the first episode and it's the rock. How do you yeah. not want to continue to support that empire? And everything he does is great. The show's actually fucking really fantastic and shot well, cast great. So um, sorry to take the plug right out from under you. I don't know if you were going to plug the show at some point. No, absolutely. But just from, based on how we started, I don't even know if you <laughs> fucking know who I am, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I I was going to definitely talk about it. I watched the first episode last week. I thought it was Thanks, great. Bro. Um, Thank you, bro. Yeah. How did you film that during COVID and stuff? Like what was we did? So so things shut down, obviously, in like March coming up on the year anniversary. And I uh, like many were like, oh, man, there goes the business. Are TikTokers <laughs> truly about to take over? <laughs> you know, if they can't shoot the next season of the morning show, maybe fucking, you know, uh creamy bunion or whoever the number one tiktoker is is about to get a you know six second movie deal um but no they figured out a way australia had leadership not if you ask me i think <laughs> look i think australia is full of kangaroos and koalas with herpes it's actually uh it's actually uh um gonorrhea you can get from koalas oh wait no it's syphilis Go is it herpes i think it's what gonorrhea from no, it's syphilis. Fuck, what is it? Let's I started see. doing a joke about it. Koalas give you what is it? Uh, this is true. I know what you're talking syphilis? about. Syphilis. Uh, what is the disease? I, I, there's, there's so many great venereal diseases. I can't. Uh, syphilis. Chlamydia. Chlamydia. I knew it was a fun one. It had a fun <laughs> ring to it. Chlamydia sounds. I, you know, I was about to say. I know it's the one that sounds like it's something you put on your salad. Yeah. Like if you were at like some sort of or at like a. It's like a it's like at a strip club buffet. There's probably either a girl named Chlamydia, someone with it, or <laughs> yeah. some part of the buffet that offers you a condiment. Um, anyway, that being said, shot in Australia because they did things right. They had somebody to tell them to get their shit together, and uh, and not their fucking you know pillow spokesman being like, "I've got the cure. <laughs> it's in my cock," you know. And uh, so it was awesome, dude. Quarantine for two weeks in a hotel. That's oh. a lot. Yeah. I had a schedule, though. They gave me an exercise bike, so I was able to get a sweat on. Had a balcony to get fresh air, which was huge. Yeah. If I did not have that, might have lost it. Um, could order booze, order food, got a per diem. That was fine. Had stuff to do in L.A. that was, like, early in the morning, so got into a rhythm of going to bed 8, 9, getting up 5, 6, okay. um, having the day. Kind of nice. Uh, but yeah, by day four or five, I definitely was like, there's that sink again. <laughs> there's that mirror again. Hey, there's that balcony again. Doesn't look that high. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, and then uh, and then next thing you know, two weeks are up. I'm outside. Went to rugby games, went to bars, got to know the local comics. And uh, Ronnie Chang uh, is in the show as well. And he set me up with a couple dudes that set me up with more dudes that that uh that turned into the best orgy ever <laughs> yeah. no then it was like do all the all the uh all the young comics in the scene and i was doing two three four shows a night and it was awesome and uh and uh didn't want to come back and some people have it you know and some friends of mine that are shooting big movies are just finding ways to continue their stay and shoot their shows out there now so wow. that's the move but it was awesome man it was if we get to go back and do another season there i'd have no problem with that 
Yeah, that's that dude. That's fucking amazing. And I mean, like working with the Rock. That's just in. That's absolutely incredible. What- it's crazy, man. It's um, <laughs> it all started. I mean, I don't know if you want to give people your audience. You probably have. You follow me on the IG, and I feel like you know. Uh, other than that intro, fucking blunder. I feel like you've got a pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> handle on on what i'm up to because you're just a, a a sweet homie that has uh always been uh at the precipice of what's happening man and i feel like you have somewhat of a of a um an idea about how this relationship formed i want to hear if you think it formed the way that you may have seen online go for it the relationship between us formed Dude, not everything's about you, Matt. Okay, I want to tell you this with a whole lot of sincerity. No, man, me and The Rock. Yeah, no, actually, actually, you know what? Give your audience ours first because they're going to be like, dude, how'd you get Adam Ray? No one's going to say that, by the way. But, (laughs) uh, but, but, but give them, uh, give them the, um, give them the story, dude. I'll, I'll say as I remember. Feel free to say, no, that's not what I remember. So when I started stand up, like seven, a little over seven years ago, I started listening to your podcast about last night with Brad Williams, and I was like, okay. Check under your chair. Brad could be there right now. Keep going, Matt. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and um, I, I, I loved it. You guys did comedy, had some great stories, and I, for some reason, I don't know, I just related to what you guys were saying and joking around about. And then you came to... Uh, to Boston, and Laugh Boston, yeah, yes, did a show. I went, I brought my girlfriend, and uh, I talked to you after. I was like, I love your podcast, and um, talked about comedy or something. And then you were like, Come back tomorrow night, hang. And you had uh, Avery Pearson with you, I believe. If, if he was playing piano, yeah, and stuff. yes, yes. Okay. Was this the weekend that Dana Carvey popped in? This was. Uh, this was probably. It was a actually year. Avery's only Avery's only been with me once. It was it was okay. over a year ago. It is the weekend. So Dana popped in on that Thursday for the whole weekend because he was shooting a special in Boston for Netflix. Yes. And Dana and I, Dana Carvey, um, people were like Dana White, no, the other Dana, and uh, and we started to become homies. And so he's in there doing a special, and he sees, um, he sees uh, that we're. Uh, out there and he gets me he's like, I come to my family see the show i'm like and obviously do time and he's like if that's cool I'll do 15 20 i was like do whatever you want yeah. he goes maybe i can come do 30 or something after you and then we can uh riff podcast style i'm like awesome so we bring him out after me he does like 45 50 and then i come out and we riff for another 30 by the way all the owners came down of the club because this is dana would have no reason to be at the comedy club because he's doing right. um you the know wilbur. uh he's doing the wilbur and um and, uh, you know, it was just a cool thing for the club. Made me look cool in front of them. It was awesome to have them there to riff with them. The pick, uh, the, uh, the, the crowd loved it. The keyboards and we were going to improvise a whole song like a Paul McCartney. I was, we were going to do some other Beatles voices. The okay, last, great. I don't know. How, I don't know how I you last wrote. heard. Oh God. What? A, please tell me it's, <laughs> it's, it's past. Hey, Matt, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, you and Dana were going to do Beatles voices and riff and sing. Sound guy fucked it up. We did a whole sound check. It was all garbage, but Dana was a blast. Um, and then, yeah, I think it was that Friday or Saturday you came through. And I remember you, yeah, geeking out a little, but in a very sweet way. So, yeah, you were saying it was it's tough for tough for any young comic to get the balls to go up to say what up to somebody, especially in that field that you may have found them to be inspiring uh you know on if they've affected you in any way to go up and try to chum it up so i thought that was cool that you did that right away and yeah you definitely have way more confidence now than you did then i mean you definitely were like you know sweating a lot and like (laughs) you you kept looking at like my chin and i was like dude just i'm right here and uh even your girl at the time was like fucking fucking get it together like you're blowing it for you're blowing it for you know and um but uh, and now here we are, man. And then you came out to L.A. You kept in touch. You know, it's that's the thing. I think I even said, didn't I say, like, if you come out to L.A., bug me or something or. Yeah. Well, you were fucking just cool right off the bat, because every time you came back to laugh, you were nice enough to hang or just like 
put up with me. And then you gave me a spot probably uh, like three years ago now. And yeah, it was probably just, three years too early, some would say. But <laughs> yeah. and no, you were great. It was just fucking just cool. And I appreciated it. And it's moments like that when people like you kind of reach out and show some form of like support or whatever it is that just keeps me going, you know? And I want to, I would love to be in that situation for someone someday to be that guy that's like, that reaches out and is in a show with the fucking rock and says, you know, keep going and do a spot. It does feel cool. And it's like, yeah, man. I mean, and, and of course, and <clears throat> you could tell too that you wanted to do this and that you, it was a passion and that, uh, that speaks volumes right away. Cause then it's like, Oh, I want to help this kid. I want to in any way I can. So, uh, at the very least was chopping it up with you the first few times talking comedy shop and then, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, giving you my number. So when you came to LA, if you needed whatever and, and, uh, and then giving you a spot like when last time I went back there because it was like, oh, cool. Like you were very vocal about, oh, I've been actually doing this and and um, and and making it a priority and I'm really going for it. And I get, there is just a special bond between and that's why it is a very it's a very a fraternal vibe to it because it's a small community as big as it feels of people that really just are sacrificing yeah. relationships, social life, uh, you know, um, to to make the the dream possible, man. So the fact that you were going for it, I could pick up on that, um, was really cool. Are yeah. you still with the girl that you brought to the show? Yeah, uh, April will be nine years, man. Whoa, <laughs> yeah, congrats, dude. That's amazing. So she she made the move with you. Yeah, we we moved out to L.A. Um, and we were there for two years. Then the pandemic happened, and you know everything shut down. So we're like. We just went back to Boston. We're going to be here till September and then cool. are either going to go back to L.A., depending how things are, or um, we were thinking Austin, but I don't know if that is a bad idea or a good idea. You know, everyone has so many opinions know. on it right now, but I'm like, I'm going to do what I think is right. I think that's the move. I, I'm going down there uh, mid-March and then end of March through April for about a month to do shows and just be around it. But, you know, my girl just got back to L.A. today and she's like, wow, it's it feels like it's back. Like she's like, things are open. People are out. They're jogging. It looks cleaner on sunset. But, you know, I equate it being back to being like movie theaters open. Gym's open. The mask thing ain't going any anywhere for a minute. But yeah. comedy clubs, that to, is just how I and probably how most comics are dictating if a city's fully open or not. Yeah. Uh, and Florida never was even touched by it. I just did shows in Tacoma, the Tacoma Comedy Club. It's really the only comedy club really making moves here in Washington State. 25% capacity, so it was 100 people versus 400. Um, but it was great. 100 was awesome, and the shows were fun. And and there was a gal on the uh, early Friday show, and real thick accent, and just being, you know, her friend, I, her friend really is what got things going because she was one of these laughers that was like, like silent for a minute, felt like she got the wind knocked out of her. And then it sounded yeah. like oh, the wind got knocked out of a donkey that she was birthing. <laughs> so it was like. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, what just happened? Can you leave? That's distracting. That's yeah. how you express joy publicly. And, uh, and then. So her friend was like, that's my friend, you know, Lurleen or whatever. I'm like, I love that accent. Where's that from? Houston. And uh, start getting into it. And what do you do for work? You know, just immediately just trying to get some info. And and you see me do crowd work, man. I just yeah. love to. It's how I am offstage, too. I like to very curious in people, especially someone with a thick accent like that who's speaking up. Not everyone in the crowd speaks up with a lot of conviction and confidence. So it's always uh, amusing and way it piques my interest when they're like from the crowd really take like i know i wouldn't be that way I, you know um if i wasn't doing it but so i'm like well what do you do it's like i own a my own shop called splash and sass i'm like <laughs> no you guys way. definitely sell fleshlights and you don't have any more gum and she was like oh stop that it's like we bedazzle anything you want and i was like anything and she's like anything jackets coats i was like cock rings she's like if you bring it we'll bedazzle it and uh and then 
I was like, where are you from? She goes, Houston. I go, has business affected, been affected by the pandemic? She goes, oh, not at all, sweetheart. It's like it never happened. I go, because to you guys, it didn't. Yeah. And, she was like, and she was like, oh, well, yeah, I'm no, that's right. We just, I don't even, it's tough to, and then afterwards she comes up. I'm the one from Houston, Splash and Sass. Look us up. And she's like, got the mask barely hanging on. And she's like, I don't even know. I, You know, coming up here, I was like, you guys are still wearing that bullshit, you know? And I'm like, yeah, well, I appreciate you doing your part. It's it's how you got it. It's not that big of a deal, is it? She's like, oh, God, I can barely breathe in this thing. <laughs> and I'm like, the people that make such a big deal, even the people that don't like to get tested, I'm like, it's such a small little thing yeah. to get a lot of clearance. You know, um, I have family members that refuse to take the swab uh, in the nose. They'll take it rectally, which is a whole other <laughs> podcast. But, and I'm like, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, hopefully it's over soon and L.A. can which it will it'll be like the roaring 20s man when the spanish flu made its way out and then people were fucking just yeah. coming on walls and jumping <laughs> off roofs and everybody was just living the high life yeah. you know and i think that's what we're going to get back to and so austin's a cool move why shouldn't there be another city that's popping it's already popping rogan's really going to add to that right. equation but um i don't know man la still a lot of funny a lot of talent and it's where it's where everything's happening man you yeah. look like you can't touch it yeah. Like, and this isn't me just saying that because I'm like, oh, I'm probably sticking around. Like, can't touch it, man. It's like you got the entertainment, the comedy, the sports, the spread out, the beach, the weather, the but truly, like for us, the entertainment business being there, and you can probably speak to this, and I'd actually love to hear your take on like b moving to LA and being around it. For me, the first few years post college, went to acting school at USC, graduated, fucking started playing uh Wolverine Universal Studios to make some side cash. Yeah. And I'm out and about meeting people at like Nordstrom that are like, yeah, I'm an act. I'm trying to be an actor. And it's like, look, some people are out there faking it till they make it. Some people are out there and a majority really grinding. And just to be around that energy, yeah. it's awesome, man. Just to know that the hustle and bustle right out your door is going. Yeah, I think you can feed off that. And if you don't, because look, it's like if you're in Omaha, Nebraska trying to get it going, it's a lot tougher, man, because you're like, what, there's 12 comics out here or something. And there's a couple clubs. There's. There's not, I can't, on an off night, if I don't have a show, go see a dope show or go see a TV taping or go to a restaurant that's got people, you know what I'm saying? There's just a lot of opportunities to to get inspired is what I'm trying to say. And that's why LA, you can't touch it. Yeah, 100%. I totally agree with that because going out there, one of the best parts was is being with like-minded people, like other people that want it so badly and are working hard at it. And going to the comedy clubs and just, like, even nights being able to, like, bump into, like, you at the store. And you're like, oh, yeah, I was on the road doing all this. Me hearing that from you firsthand, I'm going, let me work that much harder so I can end up there. And yeah. just being in that environment's better. Hanging out at the comedy store, getting to watch the shows and Rogan and Diaz and everyone go up and just level the room. It's like being around that and then going to a cafe until two in the morning just with a bunch of comics talking like that environment itself is so it's just the energy to feed off of and keep going yeah it's yeah you need best. that man it's imperative i think to the whole process like you gotta the hang is a big part of it and yeah. you don't have to stay out till four in the morning at the in the parking lot of the comedy store to 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 get ahead but like to have the opportunity you do yeah you gotta have the opportunity you gotta be around where it's happening man and i think when you do that is on you you know i if i hadn't moved down in 2001 to go to uh college in la i don't know when i would have come down probably after i graduated uh, if i would have stayed up and gone to university of washington so that would have been 2005 and and uh and i i know for a fact it would have been tougher even though it still started from scratch you graduate from college i wasn't doing stand-up during college so when I traveled uh, abroad to London, I did a few bar shows, did a few frat shows in college, so maybe eight times total. Mm -hmm. It's not, not doing it, right? And uh, it's just kind of like, you know, putting the, the feet in the water to, to see what it's like. And then and then getting out into actual L.A., it's like, oh, there's a lot more going on. It's bubble is way bigger. Yeah. It's confusing. It's more challenging. It's more intimidating. It's more exciting. All the stuff you want. Um, but truly starting from something, trying to make something out of nothing. Yeah. And right away i was like oh yeah you gotta you gotta be out and in it to 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 soak it up and have a chance to like 
network and find that group of young comics that you found to go to cafes. Like the more you're flexing the comedy muscle uh, and and getting like inspired off of one conversation, you could have one conversation at the store, wherever that, that with a young comic or someone you look up to that gives you plants, another seed in your, uh, your comedy you know, pot. I don't know. Fuck with the fucking analogy. <laughs> you know when you start an analogy and you're like, hey, you know, it's hey, you need yeah. a little bit of fucking. That makes the soup. It's your comedy soup. Your it's a recipe for success. Fucking shut up, man. Yep. That's the um, story of my life. Yeah. Uh, what? Just bad, bad cliches. Just starting something and not knowing where I'm going with it. <laughs> Hilarious. Is that yeah. is that a bit? Is that a premise for anything? Do you have anything to back that up with? What story would you tell me right now? that embodies that sentiment. I feel like I'm always, I get excited about stuff real easy. So I just starting comedy in general, like something like that. I'd be like, Oh yeah, I want to do that. I want to do that. And then I would hop up on stage for the first time. Like, Oh shit, what should I say? Like, I just get real excited to do the thing, throw myself in it. And then I'm like, I just got to figure it out. But I think it kind of helps yeah. in, in a sense to kind of just throw oh, yeah. yourself into something <laughs> without thinking about it. A thousand percent. Everyone's got to have a little bit of the delusion to be in our business. Yes. And um, because it's crazy to think to go to somewhere like that, to go to where Will Smith made it and think that you can make it. (laughs) The fuck are you? Yeah. But you got to have that. Dude, that's like I got Sandler above my head here. He is like why I've done everything in my entire life. And oh, yeah. like that's the dream. You're making movies you love. You're a successful comic. You put your friends in everything. Like that Truly. is the uh, just the definition of just killing it. Um, I agree. I want that's a career I definitely want to try to model after because, man, I just feel like I know so many funny, talented people that haven't gotten, you know, it's all relative on like success, right? Like yeah. I feel like I've done a, a handful of cool things. It's not shit to me as far as like where I want to be. Um, but then you talk to someone below you and they're like, yeah, man, I would love to have done a couple of those things. And then there's people above me that are, and I'm like, I fucking man, I, that like, we've got this, this, this many specials. Yeah, man, but I haven't done that. And you're like, wow, everyone's got their thing where they're, it's not fully satisfying them. And, um, yeah. But Sandler, to be able to put buddies in like that, I want that. Like, I yeah. know people like that that I'm just like, man, chomp it at the bit to get in a position to be like, yoink, yoink, yoink. You're all in that. You're going to help write that. You're, you know, but uh, you see his Happy Gilmore video on Instagram? Did I see it? Yeah, that was Amazing. incredible. He's like, that was smashed. <laughs> I'm not even lying to you. Yeah, that yeah was, you could tell. It was, that was awesome. You could hear it. Dude, I there's um, infinity things that I want to talk to you about. But um, when you were just talking about, you know, the amount of things you've done and what you want to do, I think you're one of the busiest people out there, like comics and stuff. I feel like you're always doing something. Like you have all the Dr. Phil things, you have sketches, then you throw out a music album, you have your comedy mm. album, you're doing 25,000 podcasts. Like when you decide you want to do, like how do you manage your time, basically? Because I really admire like what you're doing in your career and everything, but it seems like you get so much done. How do you, like, if you want to write a movie, do you go, okay, I'm going to set this time aside shows. I I'm doing this night. Like, how do you organize that? Um, I don't know. It's organized chaos for sure. I, I always had this notion of like, I can't have a plan B. It'll take away from the plan a, um, I actually think Will Smith said that, um, but not to go back to him. Drink <laughs> drink five if you're playing the Will Smith drinking game at home. That's two Will Smith references. Uh, when I say Jada Pinkett Smith, though, that's when you do the heroin. Yeah, no. um, I, I just didn't want to have any excuses for myself or ever not jump in fully. And I knew innately right away that I just needed to be doing a lot of things. It was like trying to, again, build something out of nothing, yeah. working at a casting office for free five days a week. Improv class, acting class, open mics, YouTube hits. I'm starting to make sketches, making sketches with some people and then eventually just on my own and producing everything because I couldn't find a group that wanted to commit to doing stuff consistently. I didn't want to not feel like it's that whole thing. Like if you're not doing it, someone else is working harder and taking nights off didn't resonate with me. And I just always I wanted to as well. And I knew that was truly the only way was to start 
doing and creating. And I got that from a few mentors. Henry Winkler, the Fonz, came and spoke to my uh, senior acting class at SC and who I just had on about last night, which was an amazing episode to yeah. chat with him. And and he was always like, yeah, it's on you. You got to create your own good luck, your own opportunities. And my fucking mom and grandpa used to always throw that at me. And it's honestly uh, so accurate because you got to – there's nobody else that's going to – even you get to a certain point where you've got these reps and these people, it's all on you, man. And Henry actually told me that early on when I was – I got with a good management company, but they just weren't pulling their weight and getting things done. And he was like, it's always on you, man. He's like, they could be do this, do that, but, like, it's going to start and end with you. So yeah. that really struck a chord. And and I've just – I love creating. I love doing a, a myriad of things. It's music, podcast, you know, stand-up, obviously, acting, sketches, character stuff I love. And so – it's just really once I, you know, decide something, I try to follow through because it's so cool to me to be able to go, wow, I've just created that. Like that comedy song album, yeah. just to to get the songs together and then to organize it all, edit them all, make some music videos with my buddy who's an animator for some of them and and spend a lot of time and commit on the music and making it good and working with the 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 company to to organize the whole thing it was such a process but i love that and then to finally get something that you made out of nothing it was just like that's such a rewarding feeling yeah. and everything begets every creative experience begets the next one so even if that's not going to become a grammy award winning album um it definitely moved the needle for me uh work wise if uh creative creatively mm -hmm. and that's just as important as as uh even you know getting uh something that's actually you know you book a job um that maybe helps get you into more rooms so i just always try to not ever have a down day of where i'm not creating you know yeah. uh or writing the same thing i guess but um and managing the time i don't know it's like being back in la if i'm there for a few days when pre-covid touring and i got three or four days i pack in a lot now i got a fiance and a dog so you try to manage that a little bit is you know better but that you know takes a back seat sometimes and because i'm still just very focused on that first and and i'm better now at it and it's for good because i you know hopefully i'm getting more rest and just being a person more because right. you can if you're too much in the driver's seat the whole time you got to sit shotgun sometimes and yeah and fucking take some steps back and get some clarity and be a person and that's mm -hmm. going to help you with all your um creative endeavors but um really uh wanting to maximize if i'm in town for three or four days cool hit up jeremiah let's knock out uh an improv sketch podcast let's you know line up some other podcasts you know Derek poston and i've been fucking around with these movie review disney movie uh stony podcast that we're dying to do more of if we're in the same spot so just anything doing anything and everything that sounds fun and fulfilling and creative and i also know i think i got to a point to where i know that i have other facets of i'm not just a comic you know yeah so it's fun to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's fun to even recently I started doing these like, you know, fake movie auditions that I'm putting up on Instagram. Yeah, those and, are great. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. And doing them, these self tapes down at this place in Seattle and it looked and sounded so good. So I was like, oh, I'm going to do a couple of these fake ones that are clearly, you know, not real scenes. So you <laughs> yeah. can tell it's improvised, but from a and then slating at the end. And I don't know. It's so funny. And they're yeah, they're getting a good response. And so I'm going to try to do more of those before I leave. But even that's just a different little, just creating content, you yeah. know, just, and trying to challenge yourself, keep sharp. Um, and that came honestly from when things shut down of like, I got to make sure that I don't, uh, I, I definitely turned it up more of, uh, on the, uh, you know, the creative dial. I feel like I'm always thinking that way, but I think I really tried to go, all right, what are like, what are all the, things you can do or like to do try to flex those muscles a little bit and then the writing too that's always got to be a part of it yeah. and writing scripts it's tough man there's no rule book for any of it i know there's like time management books and this and that but i just kind of do it by the seat of my pants and um and not uh, make excuses for for you know saying you don't have time to do something is just bullshit it's like you just don't want to make time and yeah. that's and that's a way to be a cannibal you know <laughs> And when you talked about like creating something out of nothing yeah. and then having the product, that is the best feeling in the world where you, you just yeah. get the idea, you do it. And when you were talking well, about- Well, let me just stop right there. Okay. Being real baked and having someone accidentally 
deliver uh, a pizza to your place and they're too high themselves to <laughs> find the right house. Yeah. And then you open the pizza and realize they somehow spilled like fries onto the pizza. And you're like, I don't know. Little Caesars had fries, but this is awesome. That's also a great feeling. Yeah, that, oh, that yeah. that's probably a better feeling. But maybe <laughs> arguably when you can create something, though, and you have that product, it's just it's it's so nice. And when you're talking about your like music album and, you know, you're like, it's not going to uh, win a, a Grammy or whatever. It's still those are your Jeez, words. Not mine. It up, <laughs> yeah, fuck. Wow. Thought we were developing some real cool rapport here, Maddie. But just, yeah, just, go on, dude. Yeah, I just had to bring that up. But you realize <laughs> like I like being able to look back at old shit I did. And be yeah. like, well, that was bad, or that was I'm better than that now, or this part was good, so I'll keep that. And then you learn to like carry that with you and ditch the other like stuff. I love yeah. that. That's I was telling you before we started this with the podcast. The first like four years I was doing it, there were times where I was like, I love it. This is what I want to do. And then I was trying to do too many other things that just wasn't yep. me. Four months yep. ago, I said, fuck all that, which is partial credit to quarantine and covid i feel like when you said sometimes you gotta take the passenger seat get out of the driver's seat totally did that i was oh yeah <clears throat> buried in with comedy and everything but to be able to step to the side slow down the podcast is doing better now than it it ever has so like I don't know. I just feel like you put so many good points out there of just that you have to just do it, create the time, make it. Because there is no excuse. I uh, entirely agree with that. You have to just great. put the time. Great. Well, thanks for having me on, Matt. It's great to see you, man. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, dude. <laughs> no, that felt like a good wrap up. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, man. But um, do you have a couple more minutes? I was totally joking. I'm good. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> we'll do we'll do the full time you wanted to do for sure. Sweet. Um, but no, man, I agree with you is basically the point i was trying cool, to make cool just say that next time your answer was definitely long you'll probably <laughs> was, need to trim that down but yeah no so say, yeah we're keeping it and i'm slowing it down just so that oh, it is <laughs> nice it is, all right cool i like that that it is longer but um dude you've had incredible guests you've talked about henry winkler like the, oh yeah the fonts that's insane crazy and, yeah man Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that's another part of the biz that no one teaches you is, is truly growing a pair and being aggressively assertive without being annoying, right? And so, uh, you know, you get to a point where you're meeting these people, you know, meeting Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy and Paul Feig and Michael McDonald and Michael Rappaport on the heat. I'm like, I'm going to try to keep in touch. And we became pals on the thing, so you want to – it's all on you to kind of keep it moving and and then got to a point to where they all, you know, did the pod, obviously, and are all still homies, which is just awesome because, you know, I it was the first big thing I did and I didn't realize that, yeah, it's not uncommon for people to do projects and then just that's that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I was a little overambitious because the first thing, but it, again, it was two and a half months with all these people. So, yeah, it's like you feel a bit more of a bond. But, um, yeah, I mean, just it's a great thing to have to be in a position when you meet someone somewhere, or, you know, uh, to, to have that in the back pocket to, to want to, you know, get to know them a little bit better. And it's a great forum for that. And shit, I was doing some press for mad TV and, uh, it was a thing on extra and Chris Thompson, who does a lot of stuff for NFL Fox Sunday was hosting it. And it was like a, what guys, what women want with three guys. And so mad TV had me do it as like the comic, uh, Nick Vial from The Bachelor. I think he just come off The Bachelor, and now him and I are kind of buds, and we uh, have have done the pods for each other a handful of times. And then Jason Drulo was the last guy, <laughs> wow. and uh, and I just ended up, you know, giving some normal answers at first, and then I was like, I gotta turn this up. I'm here to be funny. Drulo's there to be hot. Vial's there to be hot and boring, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and I gotta. So Nick started giving these real chill. And he's a good guy. Didn't mean didn't mean to come off douchey, but I just was like, I'm gonna roast him and his answers. And I had Carissa rolling, I had Derulo rolling so much so that we swapped numbers. He was gonna yeah. come to my show, headlining the Improv that weekend, didn't. But then we started <laughs> chatting about the podcast. 
going back and forth. He's like, man, I'm going on tour. I'm like, bye bye. It's not gonna happen. Then all of a sudden, one random Wednesday, he's like, can you guys come over like in an hour? And I'm like, Brad. And he's like, I don't leave till tomorrow. Now I'm like, thank God. Go to his mansion. It was unbelievable. Uh, but just I'd stayed on it, and it's all out of sight, out of mind, you know, with with booking guests. But and most of them, you know, I've had some report. Like that was enough with him to where he felt comfortable to do the pod, you know. And you try to take advantage of that. Be cognizant of like. Hey, man, I just made this guy fucking laugh a lot. So mm-hmm. and even in my head innately, I was like, the pod is what I want from this. Like him coming to my show would be cool, you know, but he now thinks I'm funny. And we chatted and he was so. Le- so what's the next move? You know, now it's on me to to stay on him to try to get it going. But um, yeah, man, we've had some Neil Patrick Harris. We went to his place in New York, oh, Brad wow. and I. You know, Sue Bird, uh, the WNBA super, superstars done it a handful of times now. And um uh, I got to interview Tony Danza as yeah. Tony Danza. I was that just was- going to bring that up. The oh, yeah. Tony Danza. And you were like asking him about, uh, you're like, that was incredible. That was a while ago. I, it, you're like, <clears throat> um, I'm going to try to do it. It's it, Tony Danza. You're, you're like, uh, do, do, does Tony Danza like meatballs or something? Oh yeah. He goes, what's, what's our favorite food? He goes, our favorite food <laughs> yes. is, you know when you get a spicy marinara? I'm like, oh, I love that. He's like, I know you do. I go, I know you do. And he goes, you take the It's really about the meat and the meat sauce. And so I had my buddy animate that whole clip. It's really oh, great. I think it's on my YouTube page. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, just a real cool uh, asset to have as far as trying to, honestly, man, strengthen relationships and get to know people and, and having the podcast to really uh, – you know, get good. It helps every facet of the game, right? Like eye contact, chatting it up, improv, being able to hold a conversation, um, everything. And, uh, and I, I definitely attribute, you know, being socially, uh, you know, just comfortable at places with Mm non-comedians definitely to, um, the podcasting game, because now I just don't, don't feel like there's a conversation I can't handle or get out of, or, or I just now have a stronger grasp of like, cool. I can feel that these people are boring. I'm going to kind of take over a little bit. Right. Yeah. Um, or, it, or at least know that I'm going to have to do more of the heavy lifting because, you know, and in Brad's case, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting cause I, you know, <laughs> um, cause he, uh, cause he couldn't pick me up. So, no, Brad's great. Brad is now back on the road quite a bit, which is awesome. That's He's cool. He was one of the first guys to really hit the road, I think, with the pandemic hit, which was cool. When you, To go off of what you were saying, um, it is an art to have those conversations and the podcast. Like it, It's not just – like a conversation is an art. And I feel like you nail the confidence with that stuff. And like your crowd work is incredible. I remember oh, thanks, bud. Uh, one night you – Got me in to be able to watch a show in the uh, the OR at the comedy store. Before I moved out there, I was like just there for a while. And yeah. um, you went up and with the late Jeff Scott, um, oh, yeah. you, I mean, did 10 minutes on a, a bug or something happened to fly by a lady's head. And you just created a whole song on it and just Whoa. murdered the room. And I remember going, well, I've got a long fucking way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Based off that, yeah. You, well, it's I mean, incredible yeah. what you do. Oh, thanks, man. I mean, reps, dude. Just years and years. You say that, I think of a lot of good times. I think of a lot of times where I was like, God, I can't wait till I don't feel like this on stage. You know what I'm saying? And that just takes a hot minute, man. Everyone's journey is different. Gerard Carmichael, probably super comfortable right out of the gate. But guess what? Like, truly comfortable and... In his element, yeah, years later, but it just, uh, everyone goes a different path. That OR used to be uh, the original room at the comedy store, which is, you know, arguably one of the best rooms in the world, is challenging and great because it's intimate, it's dark, you get people from all walks of life, all parts of the world there nightly, and it was so intimidating for the longest time because my intro to it was open mics, the potlucks on Sundays and Mondays, a lot of comics watching you. Yeah. Wasn't accustomed to that. I mean, I started in L.A. because I did maybe one open mic in Seattle before I moved to L.A. And then just to feel like I had done stand up once and then starting in L.A. post college was didn't really think about it because I that's just where I was going to get going. But the store was just I didn't I wasn't a fan of that many comics 
watching you and people that you look up to and you're like man i'm not ready for anybody to i thought i could do this in secret and then pop out of nowhere uh you know like uh like uh like something you know they've been <laughs> cooking for a little improv stuff matt you can edit this out but I, but it's but um yeah man the the store is a special room if you can get comfy in it and and do your thing and the music stuff with jeff was always so special because you know i'd get these late original room spots and when you first get past the comedy store you just pumped to be passed so you're like man you put me up at 115 at the end i don't give a shit Four people, two people, 20, I'll make it work. Mm -hmm. You know, you're so, you have this great attitude about like any spot I get, it's like supposed to be there. And then things get going and you start seeing the better spots. And you're like, fuck, I would love an 11 o'clock spot. I feel like I'd crush that, but credits and hierarchy and, you know, not being ready for that. There's there's definitely a rhyme and reason to the lineups. And, uh, <clears throat> and so slowly I started to get a little bit earlier. 1245, 1215, some 1145s, 1130s. And Jeff and I, though, in those late spots, you know, I had a big musical theater background and he obviously did. And we'd talk about it. And then when I just went up there and he started playing and I just, he kept playing and I started sing, talking some jokes and then just doing crowd work like I would do, but singing and making up these songs off people. And it was just really special. We did a few minutes. Next set, I was like, let's try to do it the whole time did it the whole wow. 15 minutes and then uh and it would go great and it was a it was an amazing weapon because you know if i'm up at 12 30 12 45 people have seen over two and a half hours of show mm -hmm. they're ready for something different that's not just stand up so it was perfect for that and then it gave me an, an opportunity to <clears throat> challenge myself to to do something i hadn't really been doing that was creatively another thing to maybe get good at and to to again it's not traditional stand-up, but it's using the stage for yourself to gain confidence, to gain, I'm flexing the improv muscle. It's the listening, the timing. It was just all things, all the boxes were getting checked uh, for the creative muscle flex. And uh, which by the way, sounds like just some really <laughs> posh, like festival that the creative muscle flex sounds yeah. like, I don't know, a, definitely started by like, you know, people that, Look, I don't want to say that they're Jews, but like <laughs> people that are um, just a little hoity toity as far as like this is like a club. You know, sometimes those people that, you know, they have Costco club memberships and you don't and they like invite you to go to Costco. And then when they find out you don't have a card, they're like, oh, I didn't. Oh, and then they use that to kind of gauge like the rest of your friendship. Like, you don't have a Costco card card and you're like well no I, I don't I never thought I needed one can you not afford it and you're like oh you're that you're that guy yeah um there was a point to that but um <laughs> yeah man making the late night spots work for you only makes you better not trying to massage your spot and be like man I wish I could try to get up earlier it's like the, let the cards fall where they may mm -hmm. and that OR is special for that man and that's why I, I truly miss Jeff for so many reasons but we really got to have that bond that other people did singing song stuff, but not like we did, man. Opening the show, I started opening a lot in the last few years, and we do it right out of the gate, and it was just awesome, man. And I know we had a special bond. I took him on the road a few times with me, and wow. and it was awesome to see him like in his element. San Fran, I'll never forget. We're on the punchline stage, and and that's where I did my um, uh, my album special, Read the Room. Full videos out on YouTube, you can watch, and we're up there and he's just eyes closed jamming away man we had a blast people loved him it was cool to see people love him outside of the comedy store he had friends in san fran so he was just milling about the city catching up with people and <clears throat> it was great to uh to do that for him and, and to have him out there and and uh and he really made the or doing that made me so comfortable and then obviously it's different than doing stand-up you know there's a lot less there's a lot more silence in just a regular set but um, it really cemented my uh, composure in that room and um, and allowed me to have something different, which was cool. You know, as a white dude, you're like looking for something to like separate you from the pack, right? You're like, hey, look at that. Uh, this pube is a little longer than the rest. Like, That's not going to do it, man. You need like a hook somehow. It looks like a hook. That's not what we mean. Yeah, you, know? yeah, you definitely have your personality, your voice. Like you have from an outsider's point of view, you have like your Adam Ray, like you have oh, your good. style, your everything. Um, dude, I, I 
could do this forever. I appreciate you doing the. Are we done already? Um, we could do more. We could do another 10, 10 or so if you want. Uh, what other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so much. But one random thing that I love is yeah. when you and Rick Glassman get together. That oh, is yeah. on those pods. The the Adam Ray two point is uh, that is dude. It was like just. <laughs> perfect of what it was just getting high telling stories but it worked for some reason yeah we just were in the bit boat dude with no life preservers and went for it and rick and i have known each other for <coughs> quite some time and and uh since i was about maybe a year and a half in and he was just getting going and we always just had a fun energy and and we'd start to see each other at auditions and we'd always do bits outside and in the room and yeah and just a really good give and take, man, a respect. It was like a mutual respect. Both thought each other were funny. And also things about him that seemingly could be annoying and are didn't bother me and I enjoyed. And and he just, it's fun to have somebody that just is down to play fully. And I like that. Yeah. And we we both have a lot of, you know, common interest. And, but there was just a real ease with the back and forth and getting high even more so. And <laughs> I think we really want to make each other laugh when we get baked. And that's that's fun. Yeah, having someone where you can just there is no filter, period. Yeah. And you could just go off and risk it and fail and all oh, that. Yeah. That's that's like the best vibe to have. When uh um, right, well thanks for having me, Matt. This was great. <laughs> I oh, okay. You were about to again, speak. I thought that was the end. No, again, I thought you speak in these sentences sometimes that just come to a screeching halt <laughs> unexpectedly. So I was just like Yeah, I thought, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, You'll be I can't wait to see you host a late night talk show because they're gonna never know when to cut to commercial. You're gonna be like, yeah, yeah, no, that's um, that's great, and that's why that's great, you know, because it's <laughs> cut to come. Uh, you know what? I like that you think that I'm gonna be hosting a late night talk show. Oh yeah, dude, you can do anything. What do you want to do? What's the goal? The the dream is tour as a headliner, number one, and cool. then. Uh, just be able to create movies and do that always. That's that's uh, that's the big dream. I love it. How about you? Because you said that you haven't accomplished what you want to yet. And no, you know, my- I'm on my own show. I'm on my own show. You know, uh, scripted sketch. You oh, know, okay. Um, like a curb. Well, there's a show that I'm getting ready to start taking out, and uh, it's yeah, it's what I want to be doing. So where it's got a little, it's acting obviously it's scripted but it's you know getting a lot of the character uh work going and um that's a fun kind of fucked up family dysfunctional family show and um yeah man i even just being up here in seattle the last week and a half like just so many things that i uh in just hanging out with my nieces and nephews the last few days and you know t- today they're telling me about how uh you know, they prank call uh, places every now and then. I'm like, dude, that's all I used to do. I used to prank all Seattle sports radio stations as a kid and just do real <laughs> three, four times I get through in a night and be like, we should trade Ken Griffey Jr. for some p- peanuts. And they're like, who is this? <laughs> or I, then I call back and be like, yeah, man, I'm just saying like, you know, Jay Buhner's not that good. Like he shaved his hair. Like maybe he's a Nazi. They're like, what is, hey, you know, how old are you? And then uh, my niece are like, yeah, we used to, uh, or we've we've done that in the last uh, couple months, just being bored in quarantine. I go, what are some of your prank calls? And one of them starts laughing right away, right? And I'm like, oh, this is already going to be bad. It's almost like when a kid's like, hey, watch this, watch this. I've done yeah. this joke, you know, watch this. And then they, you're like, nothing impressive follows watch this. I know it's going to suck. If you knew it was dope, you would have just done it. So the fact that she starts laughing before she told me, I'm like, you already, it's already not going to be as good as you're <laughs> uh, allowing me to anticipate. So she's like, we called Subway and asked if they had pizza. <laughs> I mean, come on. And you're like, yeah, uh, terrible, you know, uh, obviously. But I was like, well, what'd they say? Like, we hung up and I was like, all right, I appreciate the attempt. I love that you're even in this realm of thinking. Let me show you how it's done. Right. Call up Subway. Hey, Subway. Hey, do you guys have pizza? No, I'm just kidding, man. Hey, do you remember when you guys hired a a fat guy who was addicted to child porn to sell your sandwiches? 
Yeah, and then even when he got caught, you acted like you didn't know what was happening, and you tried to cover it up and brush past it by offering like some new breakfast quinoa wrap. You remember that? What a bold move. You guys fucking suck. I'm a Quizgo, Quiznos guy now. Um, but they, uh, they're, they're just like a constant source of material and take it down a pegness. Um, but, uh, but that's why I like coming up here. Cause it's a little bit of a break, you know, you gotta have that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, if that's what's boss, what Boston is doing for you, but it's, you gotta have a little reset button every now and then. Right. Yeah. Learned that after just doing stuff for a while, it, everything gets to be so like, too much you got to take that unwind and kind of step back and you become more creative too because you go out and totally. live somewhat of a normal life um yeah. dude what was it like doing curb that had to have been incredible what is it improv because i hear from a lot of people that you kind of just like just spit basically <laughs> that's what we call yeah. it in boston <laughs> just spit. spit riffing is just spit yeah yeah, yeah pretty much um the audition, they give you a little piece of paper. It says you're an Uber driver. At some point, Larry's going to ask you what his rating is. You tell him he's one star. That's it. So wow. he's sitting behind me in a chair. I walk in. Jeff Garland, casting director. I know Garland pretty well. So share a little glance. Um, he licks his lips at me. I do a little <laughs> like that move. And I'm like, all right, I'm already comfortable. Casting director I've known for a little bit. She put me in the heat and spy and Ghostbusters. So oh, some familiarity okay. there, which is cool. But then you got Larry behind you and you're just, fuck, man. And... uh I think at my first joke to him, I go like, oh, Carol Liefer, who was a writer on Mad TV and wrote on Seinfeld and uh, has been on Curb. And I go, oh, Carol uh, says hello. And he goes, oh, how do you know Carol? I go, oh, you used to date. And he goes, what? I go, no, obviously not. Gay. <laughs> and he was like, oh, yeah. And then uh, and then that was kind of a laugh. And, and then we got into it. And Curb's my favorite show. So knowing how an argument should build and... You know, they say don't be funny, but you want to be funny. You want to plant some seeds of what I was trying to do. Trying to always give specific information in the improv that would allow him to maybe grab onto something and then say something back. And then I could hopefully recognize what that was and then just hit that back and forth. And, um, and we did that and it was awesome. And then he broke a couple times and I'm just like, this wow. is fucking crazy. And I'm listening to him talk behind me. I felt like I'm watching i feel like i'm inside an episode i mean it was just crazy man it was i'll never forget it i get out i immediately call my mom i'm like i feel like i crushed that i was like you know what though that was so worth it even if i don't get the job like year made and then i immediately am like fuck that i want this so bad because it's my favorite show i want to be on it and i like, why couldn't i have like what's the and then they asked me to come back and do uh and uh like an Eastern European accent, did that. That was fun. They ultimately end up casting a guy who's got like a, an authentic accent. So that uh, that didn't work out. But yeah, shooting it was a dream, dude, and just getting to hang with them. And then I saw him at the comedy store about five, six months later. I'm on the patio with Harlan Williams. Larry's walking down the hill from the parking structure, and Harlan's like, look at this. Get a load of this, Larry David. And I'm like, oh, he's just probably talking about some bald guy or whatever. I look over, it's Larry David. What? And I go, holy shit. I go, Harlan, I go, I just fucking did Curb like five months ago. He's like, go say hi, buddy. I was like, he's not going to remember me. He's like, ah, go take it, you know, go check up on his celery sticks or whatever. <laughs> and so I, I go over there and I walk up and he's walking up to the patio where there's now security to check you. And I walk up and I go, I'm about to say Larry. And he goes, Adam. And I go, hey. And he's like, hey, oh, it's just editing your episode. So funny, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, thanks, man. What are you doing here? He's like, and Pete Davidson at the time was dating his daughter. So, and he, Larry's getting ready to do SNL. And he was like, well, I'm here to see Pete. Might do a spot. I'm working out my monologue for SNL. I'm like, awesome, dude. I was like, you seem a little lost. Because he was definitely looking around. He's like, I haven't been here in 37 years. And I go, wow. whoa. I go, want me to show you around? He's like, that'd be awesome. So now I'm walking into the OR. Door guys are just like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, be cool, be cool, you know? <laughs> And then uh, it's my boy Larry, right? Walk around the back to the belly room. People just looking at me. I mean, it's fucking, it was so cool. People were just like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, what's up, Adam? And then, what's up, Larry David? What the fuck? You know? And uh, we go sit in the back of the OR, you know, start watching the show. Kirk Fox is on stage. Watch him for a little bit. He's laughing, loving it, talking a little bit. When's the last time you've been here? All this. Is it, is it different? Eh, not really. No. Eh, it's all the same, you know? <laughs> then, uh... He's like, I'm like, you want to go check out the main room? Yeah, we walk around the back. We're standing on the side. I think, uh, not sure who's on stage, but they're they're doing great. And 
he's watching and then I'm like, do you want to go on stage? And he goes, I don't think so. Not tonight. Not not going to happen. Not not feeling it. I'm good. I'm good. And I go, uh, they would love it, man. And you got to work out that monologue, right? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, I just, it's not ready or whatever. And then Pete comes back and he's like, Larry, dude, you got to go up. They'll go nuts. And I took a little video of it. Chris Kattan brought him out. Place went fucking berserk, dude. And uh, and he crushed. And it was awesome. His monologue the next weekend uh, was was great, dude. But, but, and I thought about asking him for his email at the end of it. And Garland told me, he's like, he wouldn't have given it to you. He goes, but, I, I, you know, to maybe do the podcast again, you know, just trying to think in terms yeah. of like how to, how to extend the relationship. But I was like, you know what, man? I saw him five months later, remembered my name. Who knows if that'll happen again, but leave it at that. I'd rather, because because he leaves the store that night and goes, Adam, all right, I'll see you. He goes, he goes, um, he goes, hey, he goes, thanks again. He goes, that was awesome. Showing me around. He goes, let's do this again sometime. And that's when it was on the tip of my tongue to be like, love to get coffee sometime. And look, right. maybe Garland, I mean, Garland said, knows him well and said he wouldn't. Maybe I missed an opportunity. Maybe he would have said, yeah, we would have gotten coffee and we'd still be chumming it up now. And maybe he would have done the pod because who knows, man. So I definitely think about that every now and then where it's like, I I felt like I didn't trust my instincts on that one. And I didn't feel bad about not asking him. In retrospect, yeah, because I was like, what's the worst that he would have said is no. Right. All right. Like, not that that would have soured. He remembered me. We had a good time. We had laughs. Like, hey, can I get your email? Like, maybe, you know, get coffee? No, I'm all right. It's not like he was going to be like, fuck you, man. Why would I get coffee? You know what? Fuck that. For you to even <laughs> ask that now. Yeah. Oh, you show me around one comedy club. Fucking go fuck yourself. It's like, you know. That wasn't going to come my way. So, so lesson learned though, you know, you just, you try to live in the moment and be quick. And right. it obviously was a moment to moment thing. Like him leaving, saying that you think it, you got to say it. You can't, I, I, if I would have followed him to the car, Hey, can I get your email? No, no. Moment was lost, you know? So getting to a point to where you can quickly recognize that stuff and act on it. Also an acquired skill set, and it doesn't always go the way you want it to, but no. you know, and to be able to have that though, because if he doesn't go there for 37 years and then the time he goes back, you're a part of that. He'll remember that too. And that's, that's even better in my opinion that he, you have that moment with him of doing curb. He goes, shows up, sees you, you take him around. That's incredible. And that my sentence is over. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah. So I feel like I have to stop each sentence, but I was waiting for it again. That was great. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, you're you're right, man. It is a, a cool thing, and and just to chalk it up for that, I I'm glad I, you know, had it. And I remember I even posted on Instagram, kind of a sentimental tribute to that night. Mm -hmm. and my boy Adam Devine gave me a lot of shit because he was like, "Dude, you got to act like you've been there before." I'm like, "But I haven't, man." And also, I'm not above recognizing a legend like this. Yeah, like that's. Like, he's like, hey, man, you worked with him. He likes you. Like, you don't need to do this whole fucking ass kissy thing. I go, I disagree. I I, I think it's, it's, you know, because a lot of people, whatever, and even some cool messages about like, oh, that's so cool. What a cool, like, you know, again, like maybe it was an inspiring thing on some level for people to be like, fuck, like, look at like the things that just knowing my path a little bit and be like, oh, he was, and he was doing that. And he got to a point where he was at the store and he was a regular. So he's there hanging and he's yeah. doing that. And then Larry comes back. So all the stars kind of aligned, you know, but, but uh, I'm not above like being a fan too, man. And, and yeah. you know, some people don't view it that way. They're like, act like you're on the level. And it's like, I'm not, man, I'm not on Larry's level, you know? Right. Yeah. That's like a, there is that other level. Like there are rappers and then there's Eminem. It's a it's a different type of thing. And one thousand percent. And being able to recognize that, I think that that's an even better skill <laughs> instead of being like, oh, yeah, we, this is normal. Like recognizing the achievement is yeah. such an amazing thing. But, yeah. dude, thank you. I'll, I won't take up Anytime, any Maddie. more of your time. All I, good. Do we do a good chunk? Is yeah, this good? Did absolutely. you get like a good? All right. Yeah, well. We'll probably be just under an hour once I edit out the weird pause that happened at the beginning. Um, Fuck yeah, dude. But for real, thank you for doing this. And um, thanks for everything that you've done in the last seven years of, you know, oh, yeah, getting, dude. getting me spots. And um, even in L.A., my parents were visiting for a little bit. And you like you hooked us up with stuff. I don't even 
know if you remember. And um, just with like going to shows and you just have done a lot and I really appreciate it. Oh, dude, you got it, man. Well, you're a hustler and a bustler and uh, and I don't know what a bustler means, but you're <laughs> you're going for it and uh, and you're a good kid and you're checking all the boxes that you need to be successful, which is work hard. Don't be a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Be funny, you know, yeah. so. Just keep doing it, man. And definitely get rid of that bush because it's distracting. But this, um, no, plant. I'm joking, dude. That's great. It is great. <laughs> what, is it a fake plant or real? This is a real plant. And uh, I think that's how you know when you're becoming an adult. It sounds real. By the way, big shrubbery guy. Don't have a lot myself, but I do kind of want one of those like giant. It's like it's like a lawn on the wall. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, like the vines or literally like it looks like grass. It's, I think it's called a it's a hedge of some sort. Oh. Oh yeah. Uh dark green, are we saying? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Like the Sean Kemp interview I just did in my podcast, we rented a couple of those and put some posters on them and it That's looked cool. dope. And standing up like against a wall that it's a cool backdrop for you know, who would have thought you just put a lawn up against a wall and, <laughs> and it's a good place to take some headshots, you know. Uh, yeah, I like your bookcase, though. I'm eventually going to get something else here. This is just my little spot right These now. are my stepdad's books. I don't read. <laughs> There's maybe a VHS of Peter Pan in there. Um, but, yeah, dude, um, this is that's why that's the weird parrot. A fucking Rita Hayworth uh, poster. I think a, a computer monitor that hasn't worked in 30 years. Um, <laughs> and a couple cum stains under the shelf. Nice. And on that note... A couple of cum stains. That's what we'll call the title of the pod. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. That'll get clicks. A couple of cum stains. You need clickbait, baby. <laughs> uh, well, I. All right, Maddie. I hope Young Rock it gets another season. I mean, it's the Me Rock. Too, man. It, it's it's gotta. Come on, I, dude. It's gotta be. Hope you get jacked up on steroids because that would just be amazing to see. Dude, just no neck, just all <laughs> shoulders. Vince McMahon, dude. Popeye arms, dude. I'll have to do that. A lot of just a lot of uh, the the. Um, you know, um, squeeze the hand squeezers I, I and know, uh, uh, the it's like a grip thing. Yeah, Not totally. He he had those on his desk uh, constantly and was just wow. constantly doing them. So that's cool. Um, and we'll see, man. Fingers crossed. Appreciate you having me, bud. Yep. Keep keep doing your thing. Thank you for doing this, man. You got it. Bye.